Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have David Joyce, candidate for Yuba County Board of Supervisors, coming up this June, and Fred Rouse, winemaker from El Dorado County. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're on cable channel 17 in Sacramento. We're on YouTube. We're on uh, Facebook under the Libertarian Counterpoint. We're on, uh, on the web, of course, at www.accesssacramento at 8 p.m. Thursday, noon Friday, and 4 a.m. Saturday, all Pacific time. Um, the, the, the House of Representatives, uh, this past, uh, on, on Tuesday, the uh, uh, 27th, I think it was, of February, passed a bill called FOSTA, Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Passed by the House, two questions. Would it have anything to do, would it have any effect whatsoever of uh, stopping sex trafficking? That's the first question. And number two, uh, what effect would it have on Internet uh, service providers? I, I think this is a really interesting idea here because my, my political mentor more than anyone in the world is Walter Williams. And one thing Walter Williams constantly has talked about is that you don't judge policy on its intentions, but the actual results of it. And there's always unintended, unintended consequences too. For this here though, I don't think it's gonna stop anything for sex trafficking. Uh, I literally saw a podcast this morning where they said down in Florida, there's an epidemic where uh, people that are going in for drug rehab, people are basically scamming the insurance providers and also sex trafficking them. That has nothing to do with the internet. So sex trafficking is happening completely separate from any sort of internet resources. Um, the second part of that question as far as like going after the uh, web host, I personally think that like the internet, even though you know you you want to say like maybe like early '90s, the internet really started to boom and people started to pretty much in mass have it. I still don't think we really know how to regulate it I, on any level, whether it be sex trafficking, um, Facebook, Google, their biases and whatnot. I just think the internet is something we still haven't caught up to speed yet and how to control it and to regulate it. And should we? That's the other thing too, is that you know you also have that that fine line of what when is that line crossed to you know spy on someone or prosecute them or whatever it is that they're doing on on the internet. So there's a lot of uh, constitutional issues that, that come into play too. It's not it's a very great thing. It's not black and white by any means. Yeah, I would first of all on sex trafficking, I would say um, the difference between prostitution and sex trafficking is that sex trafficking according to the common understanding includes kidnapping and you know slavery unforced unwilling labor this um, law doesn't really distinguish between prostitution which most libertarians agree should be legal between consenting adults um, a customer a john and a, a prostitute and sex trafficking, which is an unwilling um, victim who's being forced against his or her will to be, is being held and, and forced to perform sex acts, usually without pay. Um, so there's, I think it's really clear to make that distinction, just like you do with sexual harassment. Well, rape is one, you know, one extreme, and on the other is uh, a lewd comment in the presence of a member of the opposite sex or this uh, opposite sexual preference or something saying something offensive and there's there's a broad range of things there and I don't think that it's um, I don't think any uh, the two any two people can probably agree on exactly where the line should be between of offensive and criminal behavior but um, when it comes to um, sex trafficking this particular act is going to criminalize a lot of online behavior between sex workers, for example, where they talk about safety precautions, you know, how do you avoid? They have online fora where they can d discuss violent individuals that they've encountered in the past d in their line of work and they can share that information with others. Well, now that would be criminalized. Not only would that be, would they be on the line for that and, you know, targets of um, arrest because of their participation in what is considered illegal prostitution but the web host the, the the website that publishes that online forum can be fined as well um, and that is in um, going after a web host or a website for the contents that they disseminate is um, that's not allowed under the kind of the 
Computer Decency Act of 1996, I believe. Internet, yeah, yeah, the internet, com- yeah, the Section 230. Section 230 says, you know, we can't hold these people liable for the contents of, of what they put out on their website. It's the, the content provider can be held liable, but not the, the host. Um, so this is op- opening a door to a broad range of censorship of all kinds of internet. If that CDA Section 230 is allowed to be to fall by the wayside in this instance. In, with the exception in the United States, with the exception of some uh, counties in Nevada, uh, prostitution is already illegal in most states, and uh, it shouldn't be, I, you know, from a libertarian perspective. But it is. So this doesn't do anything other than federalize the crime uh, of prostitution, uh, so-called crime, and it is a consensual crime. We have a long history of consensual crimes not uh, criminalizing consensual behavior being flat out uh, unproductive, and, and it just doesn't work. First example that I would come up with would be the Prohibition era. Alcohol can be dangerous. Alcohol was criminalized, made uh, illegal by 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 uh, by uh, the Twentieth uh, Amendment, and uh, it had absolutely no effect on the uh, consumption of alcohol. It did make the mafia a heck of a lot more profitable. Organized crime uh, had a, a field day. We did the same thing with Nixon's war on drugs, which started actually before that, but Nixon made a big deal out of the war on drugs. All that did is it made the prisons have uh, up, upwards of 50% of their inmates be drug users as opposed to actually, you know, actually people that hurt, hurt people or steal from them, you know, burdening the criminal justice system. Had no effect on the, uh, on the, on the consumption of drugs, it probably encouraged the consumption of drugs. Drove both underground drove both into the black market where legal contractual uh, standards simply don't apply. The I, only I could also add uh, guns fall into that category. So all the gun laws didn't stop illegal uh, guns from being manufactured, they drove them underground. So they're still being yeah, sold. Yeah, I mean that's interesting. You, you, yeah. you know, all of, all of the talk about you know, making it impossible to buy bump stocks and mm-hmm. AR-15s. There's and still going to be a black market. Guns are pretty low tech. Mm-hmm. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was an arrest here in uh, in, in uh, Shingle Springs, I think it was. A couple of guys were manufacturing guns in their garage mm-hmm. and selling them. Uh, you know, turned out selling them to uh, to uh, government agents, and so they got busted. But it's low tech. It's not hard. It's not hard to manufacture a gun. People can make guns with. Uh, with you know that add-on building, what do you call and it? And the ammo too. They can make the bullets themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is not something that you can outlaw. It's simply make it more difficult, more expensive. That's all that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the mayors of the more liberal sanctuary cities made a big deal when it was when the DACA Act was first challenged, and there was talk of an immigration crackdown. Well, we won't, these people won't report crimes. Um, to, they're afraid to come to the police now. Illegals are afraid. Illegal immigrants are afraid to come to the police to report crimes, and um, that may or may not be true. But one thing is for sure that I do believe that people that are here illegally are probably um, working for less money, or there wouldn't be a valid argument that they're suppressing wages for you know <laughs> for the rest of us. Um, and I think the same thing is true, certainly for prostitutes that are in risky situations or assaulted or taken it ripped off or otherwise harmed, they don't feel like they can report those crimes. No, of course not. Yeah, um, yeah, not without getting arrested themselves. So we're, we're not really doing sex workers a favor. Or unless anybody. We wa- unless or anybody we just want to hand out money we, to people. We have laws against kidnapping. We have laws against assault. Slavery. And yeah. we have laws against slavery. This thing adds nothing to that. All it does is endanger sex work. And the and not to mention and, that, and, and their customers. Not to mention uh, the cost of federal, uh, just the legislation, federal well, taxpayer uh, costs. Yeah, the waste the, of time, the prosecution money, uh, money that mm-hmm. would be spent on, on this, uh, basically. Uh, well, even even just the bill, though. The tail. What? For the, even just the cost of the bill, well, just to you know, I mean, yeah. just federal tax dollars yeah. being wasted. Which this, which makes me believe the cynic in me that the real purpose of this is to go after web hosts. And to shut down well, people. that to you know, basically to intimidate web hosts, and also to give the people who the, the congressmen who uh, will go back to their office and sexually harass their their, their secretarial staff to give them some cover. Hey, I voted mm-hmm. against the Sex Trafficking Act. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. that's the cynic in me. Um, YouTube and Google are busily uh, basically kowtowing to political correctness uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, recently, I, I saw some evidence that Google was doing, or people were trying to do a Google search for purchase of Remington, Colt, Ruger, 
whenever those terms showed up in a search, zero results. What, I mean, is, is, is that something that we can expect from the, uh, the internet search uh, giants? Is that something we need to worry about, that they are basically self-censoring to uh, kowtow to whatever the current political correctness uh, vision is? I guess so. I mean, I haven't signed up for, I haven't registered on Tor yet, or the, the dark web, but it may be that that's what we're going to have to resort to if we want to get both sides of any story. Most information, there's going to be in some time, and I believe the near future, almost total information control on the internet. And I mean, my understanding of the situation is that Intel and the other chip manufacturers have been working with NSA and government agencies for a long time. The government has a back door on everything. We can't expect any privacy. We can't expect any, um, we can expect our government to have complete access to the information that we receive and the information that we disseminate. And as people um, become as cynical as I am, there'll be more and more need to control what we see and what we hear. Um, and you give people too much information, they, are, they start getting pesky. They start asking too many questions. Um, they start coming up with too many conspiracy theories, too many wacky ideas. There are too many crazy ideas out there that can't be rationally explained away or answered. And so the, the way to um, get around that problem is by controlling information. Mm -hmm. And um, Google and YouTube, Facebook, and um, other online, online, the portals that we use to, to get our information can easily be controlled and they are being controlled. And it's visible, it's happening on a daily basis. I mean, every day. There were, um, the recent Parkland High School school shooting, there were interviews with a teacher who said, oh yeah, they, they told us before school that there were, we were gonna have a drill on the day of the, you know, before the shooting happened. And there was another video of a girl and she was a student and she said, yeah, I, I mean, I, I knew the kid, Nicholas Cruz. He and I walked down the hall out of the classroom together as gunfire was going off in another side of the building, this stuff was pulled right away. Mm -hmm. And those questions aren't being answered. Um, you know, there's no official response to these claims. So, I don't know. Well, I think it's interesting you bring up Parkland, and, you know, the school shooting, and 17 people were killed. I contrast Parkland with Sutherland Springs. If you remember the Sutherland Springs church shooting, yeah. a, a dozen or so people were killed. Mm -hmm and an NRA armed man shot the killers. And that was the end of the shooting and also the end of the story. Yeah. The story right. died within, within days after it became clear what had, how uh, a, mass killing, a mass killer had been, had been brought down by an armed uh, citizen, not by the police. In this particular case, while the police ran and, ran and hid, uh, this story has been st staying alive for weeks. Yeah. Uh, why is that? The media has a has a has a uh, you know has an axe to grind. What, one of the things I wanted to piggyback that um, Fred had brought up was that um, I think there's a free market aspect of this too that ties into it. Um, I know that working on campaigns from 2012 to 2016, it was astonishing how many libertarians and conservatives completely shifted in a four-year period. And the overwhelming majority of them told me that they only read Breitbart or whatever source now or whatever, right? One of the things for me, I, as far as the free market goes, and I've said this for at least 10 years now, there is a, a huge market where a Google or a YouTube or whatever, we need to have a conservative or libertarian yeah. mega, you know, billionaire basically start that company. So wow. we, we have a voice in that same market. We, we, our problem is we're trying to buy cars from two car dealers and they don't like us. That's what the problem is. Well, I, yeah, I mean, that's true. But there, but by the same token, there's a whole lot of voices on the internet mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Reason to Cato to uh, uh, Fee to, you know, any number of uh, organizations yeah. that put the stuff out there. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to find a libertarian viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And on the conservative side is also, you know, with Breitbart, Drudge, and so forth, it's not f hard to find uh, a conservative or libertarian uh, provider on the internet. You're just not going to find it with Facebook or Google. Yeah, but you right. look at you look at like YouTube, the situation with Dennis Prager now, with Prager University getting mm. these videos banned. If there was a conservative voice well, out YouTube there, YouTube is Google, owned by Google. Yeah, but if there was a conservative uh, 
you know, company out there, he would never run into these things. You know? Well, I'm, I'm guessing that there probably are other hosts for mm -hmm. that type of thing. They're just not quite mm -hmm. big yet. I had a kind of a um, cancel a Wall Street Journal. I had Wall Street Journal subscription for 15 years, and I enjoyed the journal. You know, good writing, good mm -hmm. reporting, um, good business, good foreign affairs. And I, I would also listen to NPR. Not all the time, but when I was in my car, I'd listen to NPR, a little opposition research, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I started hearing the same stories presented with the same tack, especially on foreign affairs, I, you know, five, six years ago. And so I, I think about that... the time the, the Murdoch bought uh, Wall Street Journal? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones Company, yeah, he yeah. bought Dow Jones 20 years ago, I think. But anyway, the... Um, the idea that we, that there's actually a right and a left, and when I hear Fox demonized as this far right organization or the Wall Street Journal, I just really, they're all pretty much giving us the same they're all, stories. They're all on the plantation. And they mm -hmm. are all, yep. left and right. And so I don't think there's and, a and great the, And the people who are not on the plantation are all conspiracy sites, don't you? Know? That's right. Yeah. On one of those. Or troll farms. Let's talk about troll, troll farms. farms. Uh, troll farms have been indicted by Robert Mueller. And the other people who have been indicted are people who were indicted for lying to the FBI. Now, I have a question. If Mueller is trying to build a case that Trump was colluding with the Russians during the 2016 campaign, and the collusion that supposedly took place is that the Russians said, hey, we've got dirt on Hillary. Would you like to, feel, would you like to find out about it? And Trump said, yeah, with the, obvious, you know, with the, the assumed quid pro quo that uh, once elected, Trump would be nice to Mother Russia. That's the, you know, that's the media narrative that we've been hearing, and it's all about collusion, the Trump campaigning, colluding with the Russians. If that's the case, why would Mueller be indicting people for, uh, for, being, for being liars? How are you going to turn those into witnesses for a prosecution about, about collusion? I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's where it's going. I think this whole yeah. investigation is going not toward collusion, but toward obstruction of justice. Now, with obstruction of justice, first of all, it's a lot easier to prove obstruction of justice, and the underlying crime doesn't have to have occurred. Well, I also think the credibility has gone out the window because I, I joke around with people and I say, hey, be careful, don't get on my bad side. I'll go pick up the National Enquirer and get a Pfizer warrant of spying you the rest of your life. So it's one of those things where, you know, it's a situation to me where Newt Gingrich, from the day that Trump won the election, he warned us that this was going to happen. He said, Trump is going to be persecuted every single day of his administration. They're going to try to create a narrative and everything else or whatever. And it's just, to me, it's one of these things where I think a lot of it has to do with the 2018 elections. That, you know, they have nothing to run on because Trump, look at, look at Krugman. Krugman said he was going to be the end of the world. We're talking about four percent GDP this year, you know. So it's careful, just, careful. <laughs> I mean, he's also the guy that just put uh, tariffs on washing machines <laughs> and solar panels and steel yeah, and cars yeah, and aluminum. aluminum. Yeah. This is going to yeah. basically negate every positive thing he's done yeah. on the regulatory yeah. side and on the tax side. Yeah. So, you know, Trump is no hero by any means. Yeah. You know, if anybody deserves impeachment for a good reason it's trump but but, but, the, but, but the whole russia but, thing is is basically mccarthyism 40 years later yeah. with the russians having switched sides yeah and the thing is you're looking at the 2018 elections that there has to be a narrative to run on so when you're the minority party you have to if there's no narrative you have to create one so i mean i, th I think that's and the, the other 2018. narrative is we would rather increase taxes yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i i want to get uh, tell a little bit of a story on russia um I personally don't. I, I see um, Putin as the only the only source of any kind of stability in Syria and, and the greater Middle East right now. Um, I think if he hadn't really stepped forward and sent planes and troops, um, not troops, but military support to the Assad regime in the summer of 2015, that country would be worse than it is right now and terrible. Um, in 2006, the Council on Foreign Relations lined up John Edwards, former governor of, I think it was South Carolina, and Jack Kemp, you know, the quarterback, um, great conservative econom econ economist, and, and they started fear-mongering Russia, the CFR did, back in 2006. They said, you know, he's taking away people's rights, he's ruining democracy, he's, you know, we need to step. So that was when it was identified by our um, power brokers 
that Russia was not going to allow us open access to their vast resources, their oil and their gas. And we've had it in for Russia since that time. So I don't think this whole thing is really about Trump as much as it's about Russia. I think that Brennan, John Brennan, former head of the CIA, was really ticked off by Russian intervention in Syria. And he's doing everything he can, along with other powerful, influential people, including Mueller, Mueller, to make Russia out for a bogeyman, to create fear in the American population, to justify more um, military spending and um, more military interventionism in the Middle East. And there, uh, next thing, I mean, it's going to be Ukraine next, right? We're, we voted to arm um, Kiev to fight in Donbass. So, yeah, it's never ending. So we've, we've surrounded Russia since we reneged on our promise not to expand NATO in the early 90s. Um, Clint, that was Bill Clinton um, that added Poland and, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and then Czech, the Czech Republic, and all of these countries, the former communist bloc nations in Eastern Europe. And now we, we want to, you know, add Ukraine. Um, we fomented revolution in Georgia. Saakashvili, whatever. So there, there's a long history of us push, push, pushing against Russia, and Russians, Russia is saying, nope, sorry, it's well. Our I mean, the Cold War was nothing more that or involved the United States CIA and other intelligence agencies trying to foment trouble with Russia and with the the, the communists, the Soviet Union, trying to foment trouble with the United States. I mean, the McCarthy era uh, was about McCarthy, you know, going off the deep end, finding a commie un under every, every bed. But there were commies under the bed in some places. I mean, there, there, you know, there were uh, communist uh, infiltrators into the uh, American political scene, into American politics. Well, well, Reagan spoke about it, how they threatened him from when he left the Screen Actors Guild when he ran for the presidency. Yeah, I mean, you know, the communists had a pretty good size foothold in the Democratic Party, which I think they retain to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, right. <laughs> But I mean, the, the really the ironic thing about the whole Russia scandal is that Mueller hasn't turned up any hard evidence that I've seen that, you know, the Russians I'm, I'm were not involved in collusion, but all kinds of stuff on the, on, on, the on, Trump uh, campaign. On, I mean, on, uh, well, just the the basic the initial claim was that Russia hacked the DNC and Podesta's emails. Well, there's been. No evidence presented that that's the case. Yeah, no, nothing in collusion, all kinds of stuff on obstruction of justice. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Two different things. And there is plenty of evidence that, you know, the Clinton Foundation and Clinton Associates, oh, the, including the, the, Podesta yeah, yeah. Associates, were involved with the Uranium One deal. I mean, the, they were yeah, I mean, deep in... The, the Clintons were colluding with Russia from day one. I mean, right. the Secretary of State. And there's no discussion indeed. about that. Yeah, so. that just sort of wow. went, down to the, went down the wormhole. Yes, it did. Uh, anyway, okay. We have a few minutes left. You brought up a topic that you wanted to talk about, which I think is fascinating, and that topic is, are libertarians necessarily cornucopians a la Julian Simon? Uh, and if not, how do we envision the free market allocating a shrinking pie of fertile soil, clean water, clean air, and so forth? First of all, tell us who Julian Simon uh, is and what, he, what his bet was with Paul Ehrlich. Julian Simon had a running bet every year, that, and, and it was based on a basket of commodities and the price of that basket of commodities. Actually, it wasn't every year. It was like over one bet, a, yeah, one bet over a 10-year period yeah. or something like that. So it a, a basket of something like 10 commodities, and it was um, metals and crops and various other, you know, whatever. Necessary things. Yeah, yeah necessary things. And Ehrlich at, at this time, who was a deep ecology kind of guy and was worried about the population, population explosion population and, wealth, yeah. Yeah, and, and resource consumption and running out of natural resources mm -hmm. on the planet was his thing. And he was saying, prices are going to go up because, um, we're running they're, out. They're, it's a, you know, we've got one planet and we're running out of stuff. And uh, Julian Simon up, said, an argument. And then, yeah, the Malthusian argument. And um, cornucopian is, uh, I don't know if there's any other term. They, they, another term is sometimes boomers or boomsters. It's, it's the idea that, the, kind of the optimistic view that human technology and human brain power will allow us to do more with less. You know, we can, nanotechnology, for example, might be the way out of, um, you know, having the same standard of living with diminishing resources. Um, but he won the bet. During that period, um, and he's there, Paul Ehrlich's still alive. Julian Simon passed away about 10 years ago, but he famously won the bet um, 
so he was kind of he's kind of the the textbook cornucopian. In other words, we're there's an abundance of there's an more than adequate humans resources. Humans are the ultimate resources. Human human ingenuity will solve all resource problems. Are the ultimate resources. And I am a cornucopian. Yes. I, I'm a proud cornucopian. I think Julian Simon was spot on. I think that I, I mean I've seen it in my lifetime. I grew up on a farm in Minnesota where we would really try hard to get 1,500 bushel acre corn, right? I mean, with you know all the latest technology, soil management, so, so forth and so on, we go over the ground 10 or 15 times per year to keep the weeds down and so forth. Now, you can get three to 400 bushels per acre of corn, and you do it by going over the ground twice. Plant, harvest. Mm -hmm. and so this is, is GMO corn, so you can use glyphosate to keep the weeds down. Part of it's GMO, part of it's uh, uh, is Fertilizers. minimum till, part of it's uh, better use and placement of fertilizer, less, less fertilizer being used but being placed in the right place. Uh, a whole lot of different technology has gone into making the farms, the agriculture industry, hugely more, uh, more productive than it was in the past. Mm -hmm. that's, that's food. Same thing is happening in technology, the, you know, the whole internet phenomena, uh, uh, communications technology. Same thing is happening, happening in mining technology. Everything that we do is being improved by technology. Mm -hmm. And we've got the fail-safe of markets. Markets tell us if we're over-consuming something and let us substitute other things. The price of something going up tells us, well, hey, we're you know, using too much oil, or we're using too much electricity, or we're using too much corn, or whatever it is. People will substitute and, and figure out a, a more efficient way of producing whatever it is we're running short of. So I think with market, free markets allowed to thrive and with human ingenuity uh, and with the you know, natural tendency if people can't afford to feed their children, that's what happens to many children. It's a self-correcting well, problem. Well, the people that have the most, uh, the most affluent countries, this is the big conundrum, the most affluent countries have the lowest birth rates. So that, that's one of the biggest arguments always for economic growth. If, if we can increase the affluence of the under, undeveloped world, then their fertility rates, will, we would yeah, guess, would there's, decline. There's, a, there's another thing going on there, though, that explains that. And that is, in really poor countries with no infrastructure, no institutional support for old age and so forth, your old age pension is having enough kids that survive to take care of you in your old age. Mm -hmm. So that's what drives, that's a big part of what drives large families in, in, in very poor countries. Yeah, and this in this country we're um, doing kind of the opposite. We're um, the old old people have all the wealth in this country, and um, and they've left a tremendous debt. I'm, I've, I don't feel personally guilty. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. But the tremendous debt that we've lost, and I don't just mean financial debt. I mean, our oceans are dying. Our water, clean water supplies are running out. Our air is polluted. Our ozone layer is thin. We'll argue about that in another time. I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't know if a dire economic or ecological. Ecological. Argument. That's the show for this week, though. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place.